welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is George Jacob, President and CEO of the San Francisco Bay Echoterium. Thanks for joining us, George, and a reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions for the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. So, George, it's so great to see you. Talk a little bit about your work at the Bay Echoterium and how you have morphed the organization over the last year since you came on board. Yeah, so it's been, this is the fourth year at the Bay Equitarium, which is a, an amalgam of six institutions under one nonprofit umbrella with a common mission of conserving and protecting the San Francisco Bay and um, with a focus towards earth justice, climate justice, environmental conservation, and education. So the, um, the Bay Institute, which is the Bay Institute, has been in existence now for 40 years. So four decades of environmental policy. And the Aquarium of the Bay, which is affiliated to the Smithsonian, accredited by the AZA, has been around now for 24 years. So we, um, we function out of um, three or four different buildings in the city and one in Sausalito. And um, we, uh, we have an incredible team of biologists, scientists, divers, facilities, marketing, communications, design, it has moved at a certain pace, and now we feel that it's time for it to rejuvenate itself. And uh, we unveiled our vision for uh, its future in October of 2018, and the future looks good. It is a, um, a fairly large and comprehensive climate and ocean conservation living museum with a bigger aquarium, situated in about three and a half acres of landscaped um, zone, the green zone on the Embarcadero. One of the things that I really, really was looking forward to in, in this show is that uh, you and I got to know each other years ago um, when we were scanning the horizons for very interesting people. And you were in a totally different environment. You're not an ecologist. You're not a scientist. Um, you are a designer. You are an artist. You are a museum professional. You, you have uh, developed some very renowned uh, exhibitions uh, throughout the world and in the United States. You are not the usual suspect for running this type of an institution. Uh, just sketch out very briefly um, your, your career arc and, and sort of your attributes um, as, as, a, as a leader. And then let's talk about the actual change that has been wrought at the, at the Bay Echoterium, the whole rebranding piece, the whole conceptualization piece, but also in very recent times during this uh, COVID pandemic, how you and your team have strengthened the institution even in these very dire times. So let's start a little bit just to give people a sense of George Jacob. Um, I became a science museum director at 25, and that was some 30 years ago. And um, I, uh, the project was interesting because uh, it was not an established institution. It was under construction. So as every phase of the construction ended, I, uh, I started um, leading it and eventually uh, led the entire organization, which was fairly large, a 232,000 square feet facility on a nine acre site. And over the years since then, I've straddled both the commercial side of the museum design build industry and also the nonprofit side of leading museums, establishing museums. And I've been fortunate to have worked on over 108 assignments in uh, uh, 11 countries. And that gave me a depth and breadth of perspective, which is uh, a bit unusual for uh, the, uh, a person in the museum field. And um, that also gives you a sense of a different business acumen on how to manage money, material, and manpower, um, quite unlike uh, what traditional museums do with their business models. And that has given it that nimbleness and the flexibility of dealing with challenges like COVID. And, and you come at this not as, as a scientist, although you respect scientists and you've worked very closely with scientists, you come at this as an exhibition designer, as an artist, and as somebody who is providing experiences uh, for individuals. So. What, what I find to be very interesting is when you look at science museums, when you look at, um, at museums that are really about taking uh, what is going on in nature and, and making it accessible, 
uh, so often um, you either get administrators on the one hand uh, who are adept at, at the financial management piece, uh, collaborating with scientists, or you can also get scientists who have brought, risen to this level of, of, of management. You actually come at it from the visitor experience, from the, from the side of who was walking in the door and trying to enrich that experience um, and, and your collaborations are, are in turn rich with, with others who have knowledge that you don't possess. So my academic background is museology um, with a focus on science museums and uh, subsequently management. Um, but I do look at institutions from a visitor experience point of view. I do look at them from uh, a point of view of um, a faster turnaround of relevant content. Um, I'm acutely conscious of uh, the very slow curatorial process that happens at many institutions. And by the time an idea becomes an actual exhibit experience, it is already a little, there is a phase lag there in, in terms of relevance. Um, and I've always been interested in uh, reducing that gap. Um, one of the last museum projects that I worked on uh, was built in record time. It's the fastest museum built in Canadian history. Um, 11 months for construction and 32 weeks for everything on the inside of the museum, the full exhibit experience, which is unheard of. In 32 weeks, you have to finish all stages of interpretive planning, exhibition planning, production, installation, commissioning, and testing. In addition to all the allied services that go with a full-fledged museum, including retail, cafe, uh, trained education staff, auditorium, theater, you know, the whole spectrum. So that pace of work, uh, you know, set a new bar for possibilities and potential. In terms of what you found when you came to what then was called Bay.org, uh, just, just describe uh, your first day on the job um, after you accepted the role, um, walking into the, into the facility, um, looking at the finances, um, I know you had a very dedicated staff, but they had a lot of challenges when it came to just sort of keeping the, the living exhibitions, the, 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 the animals alive. Um, just describe what you found, and then let's talk about the measures that you took over the subsequent four years. So the organization, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, is about 24 years old, and at that time it was about 21 years old. Um, it had a, um, so the aquarium is about 56,000 square feet, it holds about uh, 750,000 gallons of salt water um, in its tunnels with about uh, 24,000 animals, 186 species. So it's a fair-sized um, facility located in a beautiful um, location on Pier 39, which the Embarcadero gets 15 million tourists a year. Uh, we get a, a sliver of that into the aquarium. And we also operate the Sea Lion Center, which is about 250 yards from um, the aquarium. Um, the aquarium is uh, a gem, it has been serving the communities for a fairly long time, and is committed to providing free education programs to a lot of children each year. And so that is, so its mission is, um, you know, truly important and vital for this community. Um, all the species of animals, most of them we, we have in our collections are from the San Francisco Bay. And um, that provides a lens into the health of the Bay and some of the challenges faced by this fragile ecosystem that supports biodiversity in the San Francisco Bay. So from that perspective, it is a beautiful facility um, located in a, um, in a high footfall area, high traffic area. Um, however, the, because of the age of the facility, it had deferred maintenance issues and it had some other challenges with uh, navigating galleries, uh, linear flow, um, the exhibits are a little dated and they continue to be dated so those were some of the areas where we thought we should do an audit. And um, subsequent to that audit, we decided to create a master plan to address some of the, uh, the gaps there and um, think outside the box, um, not just in terms of fixing a, uh, you know, a short-term problem uh, with uh, an exhibit or two, but in terms of looking at the potential of what is happening in the world today and how we can leverage um, the bigger challenges of climate, uh, environmental justice, earth justice, into one cohesive dialogue where you, where you look at problems uh, that the uh, carbon emissions and pollution and ocean acidification and sea level rise pose on one hand, 
And on the other hand, look at solutions which are either policy-based or individual action-based or based on new technologies, both at the nano level and at the prototyping levels. And a lot of it is unfolding right here in the 50 to 100 mile radius in the Bay Area, which is you know, the Silicon Valley attracts the best of the best minds. And, um, you know, um, and there have been many, many uh, inventions and innovations here that have changed the world forever. One of the things that I think is so fascinating is if you look at the old idea of the exposition, uh, the expo, um, and or the World's Fair, in which people come to experience what is new and to get their, their creative juices um, uh, going, uh, you have actually taken this, this uh, place and you've seen the potential of San Francisco as a tourist magnet, included, increasing the magnetism by evolving the institution to attract people to then have a dialogue on environmental conservation, on, uh, on global warming, on climate change, on uh, the lived environment in which we in, in urban uh, settings um, are stewarded, um, and you're, you're then sending people out to continue those discussions within their communities and adapting those lessons uh, to their environments. In terms of, of these last couple of, um, uh, of months, uh, talk about how you've shifted some of the realities here as you've had to shut down partially um, the institution during the COVID time where you had no earned income at all. Um, how you have preserved the, the health of, uh, of the animals and how you have uh, changed the operating realities, positioning yourself for a reopening. So these were truly challenging times. Um, you know, many institutions uh, have not seen uh, this sort of crisis at a uh, national or international level uh, ever. And um, it, it came swiftly, it came without warning. And um, on 16th of March, we had a public health advisory to shelter in place. And once that reality sunk in, uh, we had to quickly calibrate the impact of what that really means. And at that time, we didn't uh, know that the shelter in place would last for two weeks or 10 days or five months. So, you know, creating those scenarios as to the impact that we'll have on a shut aquarium with zero revenue and no endowment uh, that became, uh, you know, priority number one. Um, furloughing and laying off some of our dedicated staff was a very hard decision. And, um, but we absolutely had no choice because at that time we didn't even know that payroll protection plan was going to be a reality within, within four weeks of the pandemic sh sheltering the entire country down. So um, in those uncertain times, we had to take some tough decisions we moved on one hand very quickly to uh, reduce our staff strength. On the other hand, we moved our uh, request for federal assistance uh, within days. Um, we worked with our financial institutions to make sure that we had um, certain, certain deferments in place for um, rent waivers and um, you know, postponing some of our accounts payable. Uh, so we had to get very nimble with our finances. That was number one. Number two, we um, figured out a way to maintain a core staff because we have live animals. Unlike most museums where collections don't involve living creatures, um, we had that additional challenge of taking care of the animals, making sure that we have a supply chain for their food, um, and making sure that the core team uh, is in place and their um, payroll is protected because aquarium is a 24 seven operation. Right. So the animals are there 24 seven. So we have to uh, account for three shifts of operations. So that's a, uh, it's a very expensive proposition to, uh, you know, run this uh, complex organization. Which means electricity, it means yes. heating, it means- Yeah, the, yeah there's a, exactly. I mean, all of those things, you have to have utilities, you have to have your filtration systems, life support systems, you have to have divers to feed the sharks and other animals. Um, there are things happening behind the scenes uh, one of our batteries gave birth to three pups in the middle of the crisis. So, uh, you know, there were a number of things, nature doesn't stop. So, you know, we, we had to make sure that we had adequate resources and backup plans to ensure that 
the core function and our collections mandate um, meets the high standards of the AZA and uh, US Fish and Wildlife. So, so that, that uh, set of activities was um, shielded from uh, the larger crisis. Then we had to figure out, um, you know, um, how, how we would take care of our emergency needs. Um, and we were fortunate to have raised some emergency funding, uh, which happened fairly quickly uh, within, within weeks. And the process was an unheard of uh, in terms of its pace. Uh, in 12 days, we were able to raise some emergency funds. And close to the heels of that, we received some federal assistance. So that was a, um, uh, a bit of a reprieve for us. We could breathe a little easy. And then um, uh, on the footsteps of that, we've been able to restructure our, our, um, our financial um, model uh, so that we have a plan which extends for over two decades uh, beyond this point. So you not only you not only been able to retire a part of your debt during this uh, crisis, you've been able to retain operations and retain the health of your of, of the animals, and you are also uh, trying to position yourself for a, a reopening. What will the reopening look like? So we adopted a two pronged strategy. On one hand, we had uh, we hunkered down to create a lot of online content. So. Um, this is not just otter cams and some e-learning modules. Several of them are already on our web portal. But what we are planning to do is um, generate uh, virtual gallery experiences on different topics. So we are um, looking at a uh, gallery uh, platform, uh, which, would, um, which would provide content very differently from uh, say a webcam or a uh, um, webcam based um, classroom like setting. So we're kind of looking at some possibilities beyond and um, we are <clears throat> fairly ahead of the curve and um, we're looking at a pilot prototype launch in a matter of months. Uh, so that's, that's been you know, a, uh, uh, a process where we've invested a lot of intellectual capital and we've been working with one or two of our advisors from the Silicon Valley to make sure that we, uh, we launch something which is interesting, innovative, upgradable, and so on. So that is happening on one side. On the other side, you know, we put some protocols in place for uh, a reopening. Uh, we um, consulted our colleagues at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums around the country. We looked at some of the aquariums that opened back in May. And uh, as you know, that pretty much all aquariums in California have opened. Uh, with the exception of us, and we we're hoping that it should happen in the next um, uh, week or so. Uh, we're looking forward to it. But we have put together a fairly comprehensive reopening plan with uh, safety precautions, distancing precautions, and not just for guests, but also for our own staff. And there's a, a, a training process that, that's being worked on so that our staff is well trained on some of those uh, protocols that we have put in place. And um, uh, we'll be watching the visitor trends. We'll be learning from some of our colleagues of other aquariums where uh, things have been successful. And um, you know, we've, we've floated multiple surveys uh, and collected some data uh, ahead of the curve. And uh, all that is part of a comprehensive reopening plan that we've submitted to both the state and the city. And then as you gain traction, you are planning to kick off a capital campaign for the new uh, Bay Ecotarium facility um, that, that uh, you've been working on for, for these last years. A magnificent new uh, marquee uh, facility to uh, drive forward this discussion about conservation and climate and, and so on. Talk about your plans, which are emerging right now. It's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, nothing is set in stone. How can it be in this uh, in this crazy co uh, COVID time? Uh, but if you could just give us a, a bit of a preview of, of how you're thinking. It's a two-step process. Uh, the first step is we are going to um, provide an executive summary, if you will, of this larger project through a smaller traveling exhibit with a very strong virtual component. So it's a pilot that we intend to launch ahead of the curve so that people get us a glimpse of shape of things to come. You know, so it's a, it's a, 
1,000 square foot, 1,500 square foot exhibit with a very strong virtual component. That'll be the first phase of showcasing you know, what is coming down the pipeline. The bigger project, of course, we have an event that is being a hybrid event that's being planned for November 18th. Um, log on to our website. It's called the Blue Marble Benefit. And that gives you a sense of the scale of what we are thinking and what we are planning. The base facility that, uh, that's a transformation of the aquarium is, a, um, is uh, three times the size of the current uh, facility. And um, it has uh, a very, uh, at, at the very core, it has a uh, enhanced aquarium experience, but on the periphery, it has uh, this focus on climate and environmental justice um, you know, through a theatrical immersion and storytelling that uses um, Native American voices for environmental stewardship and indigenous perspectives, uh, especially in post-colonial societies. So there is the that component, and then there is a applied um, technology and innovation section where you actually get to test and see and get a feel for new technologies that are addressing uh, bigger issues like uh, carbon sequestration or uh, microplastics or high decibel level ocean pollution with noise and so on and so forth. So it's a plethora of um, very interesting components. There's also a layering of biomimetics, um, uh, both on the building. So the building has some intelligent functions that have never been deployed in the United States before. So from that perspective, it's a very sophisticated uh, a building that has a bio, uh, bio facade, biomimetic facade. So I think all of those uh, elements would, um, would be inspirational and aspirational for the next generation. Um, in terms of its global spread, uh, we are going to use a significant amount of artificial intelligence in the, uh, uh, in, on the project where the physical components situated around the world as um, uh, an ecosystem of uh, satellite um, uh, citizen science uh, pods, if you will, where there would be active curation and content sharing um, that has not been tried before by conventional museums. Well, one of the things that I find so, so fascinating about your concept is this idea of the museum as simply the smallest part of a bullseye that encompasses the entire planet. You have in the museum itself a series of exper experiences and knowledge that is shared about how to address these different issues. Um, and then from that, you go out, you, you, you basically widen your bullseye mark, you encompass the bay, you encompass the underwater uh, pieces of the bay, the living organisms, the shores around the bay, the city of San Francisco itself, and then you keep going further and further and further afield. You go to the salt marshes down at the South Bay that are being recovered. Um, you are going into uh, the ocean and, and how the ocean feeds the bay. And then you go out to sensors scattered throughout the world and collecting information and you're, you're providing real time experiences. And then in addition to all that, you have this audience coming into San Francisco in normal years where People are going to come in, experience this facility, go back and take that knowledge. I mean, it's just such a wonderful concept of, of international environmental diplomacy, uh, yet a local experience that uh, can inform visitors physically in San Francisco or virtually in San Francisco through the web. Right? It, it's just a wonderful concept. Thank you. Um, because this is such a interdependent um, uh, problem, and it has interdependent solutions. Um, you know, there are conferences and conventions and symposiums on this very complex topic of climate and environment. And you find that there are, you know, dozens of them each year, but there is no comprehensive place where you can actually have an experiential sense of um, scenario building, if you will, um, and a sense of the history of uh, human ingenuity in terms of finding solutions, whether it's blue economy or green economy or some of the other solutions. Um, a unit like this uh, is replicable in, in different parts of the world. And um, they have a collective responsibility of staying interconnected because this problem is a continuing problem. It's, a, it's not a delta, it's a sigma. So you, you have to have uh, that sense of 
um, appreciating the problem from multiple dimensions and welcoming solutions from uh, a multidisciplinary perspective. I'm very interested in also this, this odd time in, uh, in American history where that, that is so full of, of thoughtfulness around issues of, of race and inclusion, and particularly in museums, which have not been the most inclusive and embracing of, of institutions. You hold a very interesting position. You are a Canadian of South Asian, Asian descent. Uh, you come uh, um, as an insider outsider to uh, both the United States and the management of, of uh, these institutions. Uh, you are an artist and designer. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, your feelings about what's going on in terms of, of the, the world's reckoning with uh, uh, racism, the idea of, of racial disparities and how museums should function in a way that, um, that ease the, the, um, the interactions and bring society into a more egalitarian, embracing, uh, uh, sort of dialoguing uh, communication amongst people with different views. No, this is a, a serious issue that requires uh, not just a knee-jerk short-term solution, but requires some thinking and some, some steps at various levels. So you do see that there is a lack of racial diversity at our cultural institutions. Um, they tend to be monocultural and uh, there is some degree of tokenism at the mid-level or lower-level managements or lower-level staff. But the leadership, the diversity in leadership is still a, a challenge, both, of course, in Canada and in the United States and elsewhere. Um, it is certainly not a black and white issue. It has other shades uh, and other uh, sort of tones and connotations that have a, um, a bigger issue surrounding it. And in some ways, um, when you look at post-colonial societies, there are, uh, there are some chapters in that history that are not pleasant. Um, and the, the, uh, the classic dialogue of how much of history to preserve and how much to destroy and who gets to do um, the curation on that is um, sort of an eternally debatable uh, platform. But that being said, uh, having diversity at museum studies programs, the faculty at the student levels, um, and the awareness with uh, recruitment firms when they seek diversity for the right reasons uh, education of, uh, you know, that platform, which eventually picks and chooses um, leadership for cultural institutions of tomorrow. I think there is a, there is a shared responsibility between educational institutions, executive recruiters, uh, institutions, and board diversity. You know, they all need to have a shared per perspective on what is effective and what has not worked in the past and kind of look beyond um, uh, color um, and, and also look beyond um, you know, some immediate challenges to see what might work to strengthen the um, fabric of multicultural societies. There is a, um, a poet I uh, quite often remember and quote, uh, Derek Walcott, uh, the laureate, poet laureate. And um, Derek had mentioned uh, in one of his uh, famous poems, The Schooner, that uh, I come from a land where the sun, tired of the empire, sets in the west and setting so gives birth to a thousand stars. I can, uh, I have love of seeing me. I had a good English education, but I had love of seeing me. I had a little bit of Dutch, nigger, and English in me. I can roll up the sleeves of my shirt and bear the white scars on my brown skin. Either I'm a nation or I'm a nobody. In terms of, of your work, one of the things that, that in closing, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you back to is this whole idea of shaping institutions for the audience, for the audience experience, and for a very inclusive audience experience. I think perhaps when you start to think about museums, not from the uh, point of view of the experts who have always stewarded them, and wonderful experts who have always stewarded them, but now to think of museums from the perspective of the people who must uh, attend and experience and enjoy them, you end up with a totally different uh, view of what competencies come into play when it comes to management, don't you? Yes, 
Um, and like I mentioned before, it's time for museums to rethink their models, um, not just monetization models, but also the qualitative models. This generation, the generation alpha that is coming up, the generation of screenagers, they think, behave, act, and engage with technology very differently. And their levels of, um, you know, their attention span to their ability to surf the net and see curated information is on a different, different level. It's a generational shift. It's a paradigm shift. And that perspective needs to be brought in with uh, professionals who can think two steps ahead so that content can be um, designed to resonate with that audience. Otherwise, they will lose that audience. Um, you know, just the evolution of social media platforms from Facebook to TikTok to whatever else is lurking the horizon. Those are reality checks for museum professionals in the way they want to in, in, in the way they want to be useful and to engage the diverse audiences, especially the new, new generation. So I released a book a few uh, months ago called uh, John Alpha uh, Museum Futures. And then last week I re released a, a second book, which is called The Corona Conundrum. And that addresses you know, what Corona has done in the last 16 weeks to give a reality check and uh, you know, bring some urgency to the table in terms of uh, how to rethink, um, like I said, the way museums monetize them, themselves and their content, but also how the exhibit experiences can be uh, collaboratively shared and curated uh, across the digital boundaries. Well, George, we'll let that be the last word. It, 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 it's a wonderful point. Uh, attendees, thank you very much for coming and visiting. Uh, that's the nonprofit report. George, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and your insights with us. And, uh, and uh, let's keep up uh, this work to strengthen uh, civil society. Mm -hmm.